I want you to hit me as hard as you can. 20 minutes into the future. So begins the saga of a semi-dystopian cyberpunk origin story of one of the most popular pitchmen and hosts of the 80s. And it would become one of the most unique and subversive TV series to grace network television. So much so that you have to wonder if ABC even realized what it was showing when it greenlit Max Headroom in the glorious year of 1987. Who's Max Headroom? Some of you youngsters might be asking. Well, settle back. Grab a Coke and put on your Wayfarers as we travel back to the 80s and slightly into the future as we delve into a land where TV is on 24-7 and media is king. A world that could never truly happen as we switch the channel to Network 23 and revisit the marvel that was Max Headroom in this episode of Gone But Not Forgotten. <laughs> Thanks for taking time to watch Gone But Not Forgotten. If you like our show, please hit subscribe to our channel right now. Hit the like button and don't forget to click on the bell to be notified each time a video goes up. Now, back to the show. The concept and character of Max Headroom was purely something that could only come from the 80s. It was a time of new media, music videos, and the start of the internet. Computers were becoming more and more mainstream and MTV was king. The evolution of entertainment was happening at breakneck speed, and the next wave of TV personality and host was needed. Enter Max. The year was 1985, and music video director Rocky Morton and his partner Annabelle Jenkel came up with a concept based on artificial intelligence. Max Headroom would be the greatest TV host ever conceived, and he would be all computer generated. Straight from cyberpunk lore, Max would be made up of various attitudes and styles from other icons as well as the consciousness of a living man, topped off with an 80s style. He would be the perfect pitch man for the new age of media because he was media in a way. Max's origin story would be shown on Channel 4 in the UK as a just under an hour long feature called Max Headroom, 20 minutes into the future. The film as the title suggests, takes place 20 minutes or so into our future and shows a world where television rules. TV is pretty much all people have and there are laws governing it, down to it being illegal to have an off switch for your television. One can't help but think this ruling class way of looking at TV is a jab at the BBC and the state ran television services in the UK. Network 23 is one of the largest networks in the world. The offices of the board are something straight out of Orwell. Network 23 is out to win not only ratings, but the lucrative business of the ZigZag Corporation. It's a company that makes a lot of things for the general public to buy. In an effort to cram as much ad revenue as possible, Network 23 has created the Blipvert thanks to their top man, a teenage genius named Bryce. The blipvert not only gets as much advertising as possible in around 3 to 5 seconds, this is amazingly an entire 30 second commercials worth. It keeps viewers from getting annoyed with the ad. Since it's so amazingly quick, the audience doesn't have time to switch the channel. This sounds amazing, right? But there's a downside to blipverts. That's that it causes something rather like that head explosion in scanners. This happens to some, not all viewers, only with their whole body and not just their head. This side effect is, in the eyes of the board, acceptable. Enter the very tall, dashing Edison Carter. He's an investigative journalist with a top show on Network 23 called The What I Want to Know Show, and he begins to investigate the deaths that he learns are from the blipverts. After a bit of convoluted twists and turns during the film, Edison falls prey to a head injury while trying to escape with the proof of the blipverts and Network 23's involvement. Trying to cover up Edison's disappearance, Bryce comes up with an idea. He decides to download a copy of Edison's mind in the computer and to try to replicate him for broadcast. What is created is a flawed travesty that will never work. 
The network demands Bryce get rid of Edison Carter and his digital doppelganger. Sadly, the network now feels a sense of mourning as this will cause them a massive loss of ratings since Edison Carter will no longer be on the air. Edison's unconscious body is sent to the body bank. Max, on the other hand, falls into the hands of Blank Reg, who runs a pirate TV station called Big Time Television. Reg gets Max up and running, actually naming him Max Headroom due to his repeating the phrase as it was the last thing Edison Carter saw before being knocked unconscious. Max becomes the new face of Big Time, getting some massive ratings. While Max's following grows, Edison Carter wakes up from the body bank and manages to escape. I find this fascinating because the concept reminds me of a more recent piece of pop culture, namely Repo the Genetic Opera. The premise of the movie is that organs are sold to the sick and dying, or just people who want to keep living a little bit longer. The color schemes and look of the body bank and the general idea of it truly belong in that same universe. The film and eventually the series focus on Edison, his ally Fiora, and Max fighting against the network and their evil schemes. Max Headroom was very much a product of its time. The production had a very music video style and look without a lot of budget. The characters were weird and broad, but it held that special sort of weirdness you typically see in episodes of Doctor Who thanks to its British roots. You'd also see this style in a future project of Morton and Jankel, the rather infamous Super Mario Brothers movie, which they directed. A few months after airing in the UK, the film would be aired on Cinemax, sort of perfectly named amusingly enough. After the telefilm aired, the Max Headroom show began on Channel 4 with Max, just as he'd done in the series. The Max Headroom show would continue for three separate seasons, with Max actually doing interviews with guests as well. Names like Rucker Hauer, Oliver Reed, Boy George, and Jack Lemmon would join Max to dish on their lives. Max would be busy in 86 appearing on Late Night with David Letterman and also being a part of the Art of Noises Paranoimia music video. During Christmas of 1986, as the last season of the Max Headroom show was coming to a close, Max had a Christmas special called Max Headroom's Giant Christmas Turkey. It would coincide with the release of his single and music video, Merry Christmas Santa Claus, You're a Lovely Guy. I am not ashamed that I own this 45, and yes, I'm that old. The special would have Robin Williams, Tina Turner, Dave Edmonds, and Bob Geldof as guests, which is quite the lineup for a supposedly broken AI. In 1987, the original Max Headroom show appeared on Cinemax, continuing the format of videos and guests. Alas, this would only be one season, but Max was to rise as ABC took a chance on a man in a box. Max Headroom aired in March of 1987, while Max's talk show was still running on Cinemax. During the year of 1986, Max was THE ad man for New Coke in an attempt to salvage that failure. Spoiler, it didn't work, but we got some fun Max content from it. ABC series would run for 14 episodes with a pilot that was nearly verbatim the original 20 minutes into the future film that had been aired for Channel 4. There were some changes made to allow for characters to continue and to make the story and setting work for an ongoing series. There were also some cast changes and returning actors from the film. As this was an ABC production and being shown on American television, American actors were cast in a number of the lead roles. The late Charles Rocket was Grossberg, the no ethics leader of Network 23. Jeffrey Tambor was Murray, Edison's long suffering boss. Jeer Burns was Bruegel, the body bank loving thug with Rick Document as Mailer. Chris Young would be cast as genius Bryce Lynch, with George Coe taking on the role of Ben Cheviot, the more humane of the board of Network 23. Returning actors from the original film would of course include Matt Frewer as Edison Carter, Max Headroom, Amanda Pays as Theora, and W. Morgan Shepard as Blank Reg. The series expanded the Max Headroom universe in many ways, and also was unnervingly prescient on a lot of issues that we see in our world today. Many people think that ABC wasn't in on the joke, which, well, they probably weren't if they'd really noticed the commentary within the series, and there was quite a lot. Most of this was aimed at corporate media, the news, 
disinformation, and turning human beings into literal data piles. In the case of Max, this was quite literally what he was. Another key piece of this series was how people's private information could be accessed and used for knowing how to market to them and to find them. The nefarious methods of Network 23, for example, are unsettlingly close to the expanded methods we see today with Facebook, Amazon, and literally the internet as a whole. That's why a character like Blank Reg represented the rebellion against this. With the pilot, the series tweaked the role of Max's creator, Bryce, and how he operated within the series and with the other characters. Bryce actually started helping Edison, Theora, and Max with some of their exploits. Bryce wasn't necessarily a bad guy, even in the original film. He was simply a scientist creator, only wanting to do his work and learn. He just happened to also have the mentality of a teenage boy who couldn't see the damage he could wreck or didn't care too much until he was caught. Interestingly, the series focuses quite a bit on Edison, Max, and company trying to stop Network 23 from doing damage to the populace internally. Episodes of Max Headroom, as I said, seem to be on the precursor of more modern pop culture gold. One episode featured the mining of information from dreams. It also co-starred Aliens and Terminator 2 alum Jeanette Goldstein, which predates Inception by a couple of decades. Max Headroom spoke to a lot of issues which are still timely today, which makes sense as we were looking 20 minutes into our future back then. The digital society, hacking systems, and how important or dangerous our data life is hits home harder now than ever before. The blanks and their attempt at wiping out the networks and the data files of everyone that is used to track them and make them commodities is especially timely. Again, it's really amazing to look back and see something like this airing on a television network like ABC. I mean, think about that. This was on the same network as shows like Full House and Family Matters. Body banks, people. Body banks. Max Headroom wouldn't have been possible without the great actors in front of the camera. Matt Frewer, who played Max and Edison, was simply fantastic. And when you discover that literally nothing about Max was CGI, it's even more gobsmacking. That's right, Max Headroom was created with prosthetics. The ever-changing background behind him was a screen. Frewer would have to sit for around four hours getting maxed out. Even his suits were fake, being made of a stiff, fiberglass material to give the impression of the computer-generated Max. Max's signature sunglasses were due to Frewer actually having damaged his corneas due to the haptic contacts he had to wear to get those creepy blue eyes. Wearing the shades gave him time to heal up from the eye trauma. While Max Headroom started in the UK, Frewer was actually born in Washington DC and grew up in Canada. He'd have another starring series with Dr. Doctor and of course, who could forget The Stand? And for all of you paranormal lovers out there, he'd also get the lead role of Matt Prager in the syndicated Sci Factor series created by the late Peter Aykroyd. Frewer is a prolific actor and is still going strong having starred as Sherlock Holmes in a number of films and appearing in genre fare like Fear the Walking Dead and The Order recently. Amanda Pays, who also crossed the pond with Frewer as one of the three original stars, has also had a prolific career and is a genre fave. After Max Headroom, she would star in a cult classic Leviathan, and then, in a role in a similar vein to the smart and savvy Theora, stars Dr. Christina McGee in the live-action The Flash in 1991. She would actually reprise this role nearly 25 years later in the WB Network's The Flash in 2015. I want to take a moment now, though, to talk about the third original actor who came over to the ABC series, and that is W. Morgan Shepard. If there was ever an icon for geek love, it was and still is him. When W. Morgan Shepard passed away in 2019 at the age of 86, he left behind a library of work that touched upon nearly every major science fiction and fantasy that has been produced. No, seriously, go look and come back. I'll wait. Yeah, that's all him. Babylon 5, Star Trek, Doctor Who, Star Wars, and all points in between. W. Morgan Shepard was another one of those actors that I knew would eventually show up in everything I loved to watch. 
The kicker is his son Mark Shepard, who I'm sure you'll recognize as just like dear old dad in that regard. Between the two of them, they've conquered the world of geek. A few years before he passed, Morgan and Mark would play the younger and older versions of the same character in Doctor Who, and it was truly a beautiful moment of passing the torch. I wanted to take a moment to recognize him for all of that awesome work he gave us. Blank Reg is part of that cadre of characters and is one of the flashiest. Thank you, sir. Max Headroom would last for 14 episodes on ABC. Funnily enough, they knew the axe was coming and worked in some jokes about its demise within some of the writing. Of note would be director Tommy Lee Wallace, who helmed two episodes of the series. Wallace actually played Michael Myers during that closet scene with Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween, as well as direct Halloween 3. He'd also gone to direct the miniseries of It for ABC. George R.R. R. Martin, he who made Game of Thrones, actually wrote an unaired Christmas episode. Max Headroom wouldn't go gently into that dark night, though. Only a few months after Max left ABC for good in November 1987, one of the biggest hacking mysteries in the history of TV would happen, and Max would be a key part of it. The Max Headroom incident, as many call it, would go down on the Chicago area's Channel 9 news spot. While the sportscaster was talking about the Bears, the screen flickered and suddenly a man in a Max Headroom mask was on screen. He weaved around creepily with no sound really able to be heard. This bizarre scene went on for about a half a minute before the broadcast was able to be reestablished. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Sportscaster Dan Rowan was back on after engineers switched the signal to another transmitter, and he as well as everyone who just witnessed the weird scene was very confused. But the hacker wasn't done, and a couple of hours later, this time on Channel 11 during a Doctor Who rebroadcast, the screen flickered, and Max was back. This time a bizarre, high-pitched warble of audio could be heard, with the faux headroom taking a jab at a broadcaster named Chuck Swirsky and holding a can of Pepsi while saying the Coca-Cola slogan, Catch the Wave. This was a nod to Max Headroom's hawking of new Coke. Another change was that this time, faux Headroom wasn't alone. After some truly weird antics, moaning, and random phrases, a woman appeared with a fly swatter and faux Headroom dropped his pants to get spanked. This time, the hack scene lasted for nearly a minute and a half, and once again, the transmission disappeared without a trace. Copies of the hack and the bizarre scenes can be found on YouTube, but the quality is, maybe thankfully, poor as it happened during a live broadcast and appears to be mainly from VHS recordings. The footage is surreal, to put it mildly, but the even more amazing aspect of the legendary Max Headroom incident is that to this day, no one knows who did it. That's right. Even with all the powers of the FCC, they could never find out who actually did this hack, and that just makes it even that more impressive and actually very creepy. Maybe to exercise the image of a human-sized Max getting spanked, the real Max Headroom appeared on Sesame Street in 1988. E is for elephant. No spankings to be found there. As we always wonder on Gone But Not Forgotten, should Max Headroom come back? Well, honestly, he sort of has. In 2007, a much older looking Max Headroom showed up for ads for his original stomping grounds of Channel 4 to promote Channel 4's change to digital. And honestly, that's kind of perfect. Max also appears in the Adam Sandler film Pixels in 2015 as an actual CG version of himself which is just weird looking. My fake CG video host guy needs to be fake CG, not real CG. And yes, that makes total sense. Stop judging me. If you want to see Max in all his glory, you're in luck, as the episodes are now free to stream on the wonderful 2B platform. But in terms of Max Headroom coming back as a new series set 20 minutes in our future, absolutely. We need Max taking on social media and all the hypocritical lunacy that is that future he predicted 35 years ago. I mean, can you imagine Max taking on a Tucker Carlson type? 
As we discover that this Tucker Carlson character is actually a computer-generated pundit created by a diabolical news network, can you imagine the verbal takedown as Max eviscerates him over his sense of style or lack thereof? Seriously though, I can see Max Headroom and the cyberpunk genre that helped spread the digital gospel of truly coming home in this day and age. Or should I say, about 20 minutes from now. I think we would all tune in. We're just good pals. That's Ain't right. got no time for gals. You're the one I rely on, like right guard under nylon. We laugh, we have fun. We sure do. We're like the double barrel of a gun. We go together.